very much, though. Uh, we're glad to be here today. Thank you to the Fort Worth Public Library and TCU's Center for Texas Studies. Our book, Metro Music, Celebrating a Century of the Trinity River Groove, features about 500 images of musical artists, both the famous and not so, from all over the Metroplex, including not only Dallas and Fort Worth, but also places like Kaufman, uh, Corsicana, Stephenville, Weatherford, Mineral Wells, and up in Denton. Genres explored include old-time fiddlers and swing bands, singing cowboys, uh, the blues, western swing, gospel music, big bands and jazz, country western, uh, rhythm and blues, and of course rock and roll. I, I uh, collaborated on this book with my friend William Williams. I've known William since 1963 uh, when we went to junior high school together. Uh, so it was a, a huge amount of fun to work on this book um, with someone I'd known so long and been such good friends with for so long because uh, we were always, you know, trying to top each other in making obscure discoveries of, of musical artists from D uh, the Dallas Fort Worth past. Uh, one of my favorite things, for instance, that William unearthed was uh, b back in the 60s, they used to have a lot of Battle of the Bands. That was a real popular thing to do back then. I don't, uh, I don't think it's done as much anymore. But uh, one time, I think it was in 1968, here in Fort Worth, there was a, a uh, contest that, where the focus was not so much who was the best band that was playing in the competition, but who could actually play the longest. So the, there were several bands in the competition, and they played for, I can't remember how many hours. It was over 48 hours. I mean, they, they were medically required to take 15-minute you know, breaks every once in a while. But it was, it was still uh, a real marathon competition. And after the competition was over, uh, the parents of one of the uh, bands that did not win, the, the grand prize was several hundred dollars worth of musical equipment from a local uh, music dealer here in Fort Worth. And so the parents of one of the bands that didn't win was threatening to sue uh, the competition and the other bands because they claimed that the winning band had brought in a hypnotist to mesmerize the young men uh, so that they could have superhuman endurance and play longer than any of the other uh, competitors. Uh, so in the articles in the Star-Telegram had the name of the uh, hypnotist and uh, he at the time was attending UT Arlington and he, to pay his way through school, he was uh, moonlighting as a magician and hypnotist uh, in local nightclubs. And so, uh, you know, it was 50 years later that we found out about this, and I was able to track this man down, the, the hypnotist. Uh, he had been living in Dallas for the last 50 years running an audio company. And so I got him on the phone, and he, uh, he confirmed that, yes, indeed, he did hypnotize the boys, and, and which allowed them to... Uh, play longer than anyone else on, in the competition. I, I don't know how the lawsuits turned out, if there ever actually was a, a lawsuit. But uh, today, in, uh, lest I incur the heavenly wrath of Eamon Carter, I'm going to focus exclusively on Fort Worth area musicians. Uh, and I will begin by a Fort Worth invocation which was written by the great Tex Ritter many years ago. Oh, come along, and we'll go down to a place in Texas called Cowtown. You'll never meet a stranger there. Everyone will know that you're in town. They'll greet you with a smile and a howdy, how you all. In just a little while, you're going to get that Texas draw. Well, hats are wide and boots are brown. 
You gon' love this place called Cowtown. Cowtown. Now, uh, next April, I will be giving a talk at the Dallas Historical Society on the book over in Fair Park, so I'll be talking about Dallas artists there. But here, uh, like I said, we'll be uh, talking about Fort Worth artists. In most respects, Fort Worth music is not that different from the rest of Texas music, but that is something special. Our musical heritage is unlike that of any other state. No other state has the cultural mix that Texas has, which includes contributions from all three of its primary ethnicities, Anglo, Black, and Mexican. The white vocalist Ella Mae Morse, for example, uh, a native of Stephenville right down the road here, was often told, you sing like a black girl. And uh, I, I, I lose count of how many Fort Worth and Texas musicians have been told that they are either too rock for country or too country for rock. That seems to be quite a, quite a problem. Now, the, the image you see here is the cover of the book Metro Music, celebrating a century of the Trinity River Groove. And the, this is from 1930. This photograph was taken in downtown Fort Worth in 1930. And in the row of, of musicians who are uh, kneeling down there, the second from the right is the famous Bob Wills before he was famous. Uh, we got this photograph from his daughter, Carolyn Wills. It, it appeared in uh, the biography of, of Bob Wills that came out a few decades ago, but it was printed in a real small format in, amongst the, the photo layout in the book. And I've always thought it was just such a great photo that I, I, uh, I pretty much whined until William gave in and let us put it on the cover. So we... Uh, we didn't really argue that much when we were working on the book, but we debated a few things, and the cover image was one of them. There's writing down at the bottom of the photo that, that explains that uh, this fiddle band had been brought together to be the world's largest fiddle band or something like that, and they were, they were playing turkey in the straw. This next image is an old fiddler's contest here in Fort Worth in 1901. Prizes in this contest were awarded for the best fiddler, of course, but entrants also won in categories for most handsome fiddler, the oldest and the whitest hair fiddler, the tallest fiddler, the ugliest fiddler, the fiddler with the largest foot, the fiddler with the longest beard, and the fiddler with the baldest head, and so on. Now, Moses J. Bonner who won for the fiddler with the smallest foot, performed some of these same tunes that they played at the festival 22 years later on WBAP in a program that historians say may very well have been and probably was the first uh, broadcast radio barn dance in the country. Uh, so WBAP in Fort Worth enjoys that distinction. And when Bonner died uh, in 1939 at the age of 92, his Fort Worth obituary noted that uh, the Confederate veteran, Bonner was a Confederate veteran, had been taught to play the fiddle by an African-American fiddler. And you can see an African-American fiddler participated in the contest here. Now, here is a group that played classical music on string instruments. They were called the Waldo Quintet. It was very popular in the late 19th and early 20th century for uh, cities and towns to have mandolin orchestras. Uh, we have a picture in the book of a mandolin orchestra that was in Weatherford at the Pythian uh, Home for Children. Uh, and a lot of them would have, would have these gigantic mandolin, bass mandolins uh, that they played the bass parts on. Uh, but this Waldo Quintet here uh, was, part, was part of the Panther City Mandolin Club. And here's the quote. The mandolin and guitar have made wonderful strides in the past few years, 
And ere the coming season is over, one quintet member said in an 1896 report on the Fort Worth music scene that was published in a Galveston newspaper, no home will seem perfect without a guitar, banjo, or mandolin. Now, singing cowboys, of course, were very popular on early Fort Worth radio. Jules Verne Allen of WBAP, known on radio as the original singing cowboy, and then also as Longhorn Luke on another station, is seen here in a rare photo of early corporate sponsorship for a cowboy singer. Uh, he's, he's got his car there that he used to travel around uh, to, from performance to performance with all the Firestone logo and advertising on it. And I don't know if you can see his little dog there that he took along with him. So he was, uh, had corporate sponsorship from Firestone, which I've never come across another cowboy singer who had an arrangement like that. We got this photo from a museum in Albuquerque, oddly enough. Uh, but Allen was born in Waxahachie and reportedly worked as a cowboy on a ranch in Jacksboro as a young man. And some of y'all's parents or grandparents might have been members of the, his cowhand club on WPAP's program, Jules Verne's Cowhands. Jules Verne Allen's Cowhands. And here's an early version of WBAP's Chuck Wagon Gang. One of its singers, who went by the name of Big Joe, uh, was said to be, quote, the only cowboy in captivity who wears his spats in wintertime and has never been a straddle a horse. In 1935, the Star-Telegram reported that the gang had crooned some 3,000 songs on local radio in the last three years. And the next cowboy singer, was one of my favorite discoveries in the research progress for the book, research process for the book, rather. Now, this is TCU physics professor Newton Gaines. Uh, Newton Gaines learned cowboy songs at his uncle's ranch uh, near Marfa when, when he was working out there for a time. And he not only sang and wrote scholarly essays on cowboy songs, but he also published research on the effectiveness of sound waves in killing bacteria. In 1940, he recorded some 30 cowboy songs for John Lomax's Library of Congress collection. And this is one of the many photos we got from the uh, University of Texas at Arlington special collection. They have quite a bit of uh, Fort Worth imagery, including, of course, their, their Star Telegram collection. Uh, it's, it's it's, real, it's a really wonderful resource. Now this hombre, Red Stiegel, of course he enlivens Cowtown with traditional Western music today. Uh, if I were a little more technically adept, I might have gone ahead and switched this image out uh, for today with an image of, uh, of Don Edwards. I don't know if you all are familiar with Don Edwards. Uh, we lost him recently. Uh, but he, he uh, grew up in New Jersey, and his father w was a vaudeville magician uh, for a time. Uh, but, but Don grew up, like many kids back east, uh, just fascinated by the West. Uh, he read and anything he could get his hands on and saw all the movies and had all the records and everything. And then when he, when he was an adult, he came west and settled in the Fort Worth area for a long time. Uh, he got a job at Six Flags Over Texas as a cowboy singer where uh, he auditioned with that song, The Strawberry Roan, and got the job there. Um, and then for a long time, he was involved with the White Elephant Saloon here in Fort Worth and ha had a, uh, just a, a really great career. Uh, he, he described Western music uh, in the, over the last few decades as being a niche genre. But, but people referred to him as America's leading cowboy balladeer. But Red is equally interesting, really. His career started at age three at his uh, family home in Sanford on the Canadian River up in the Panhandle when he belted out the classic cowboy song, When the Work's All Done This Fall, uh, for his family. And then uh, 
at some point uh, as a boy, Red contracted childhood polio, and I understand that he, he uh, achieved the, re regained the use of his fingers by practicing on the guitar and mandolin using one finger at a time, a real, it must have been a real laborious process, but he kind of basically retrained his body. Uh, and he, he's had a great career. He has a, a big festival here in Fort Worth every spring, every fall rather. But now let's move on into the blues. Here's the great guitarist T-Bone Walker when he was the band leader for the Jim Hotel. The Jim Hotel uh, is no longer standing in Fort Worth, but it was a really important site for early blues and jazz in Fort Worth. And, uh, and like I said, uh, T-Bone Walker what was the band leader there for a time before he moved out to California. So he, he, his roots were just as much in Fort Worth as they were in Dallas, where he, where he grew up. And his very first record, which was issued in 1929, was entitled Trinity River Blues. That dirty Trinity River sure have done me wrong. It came in my windows and doors. Now all my things are gone. And one little known aspect of his career that we talk about in the book is the fact that his final public performance may have been here in Fort Worth. Uh, very well may have been here in Fort Worth. Uh, uh, all the books and everything say that he I think it was in Pittsburgh where they said he gave his final public performance. But either on that trip or another one soon after that, he stopped off in Fort Worth to visit friends and revisit old haunts from his youth. And uh, he sat in with Robert Ely and his five careless lovers at the Bluebird Club in the Como area of Fort Worth. And uh, William and I interviewed uh, the Fort Worth guitarist named Sumter Bruton, whom we lost just recently also. And Sumter told William and me the story of the performance and let us borrow his rare clippings about it from the now defunct Fort Worth Press. But uh, apparently uh, T-Bone was not in his prime uh, shape at that time, but he still really enjoyed sitting in with the band and getting together with people here in Fort Worth and who had some of his old 78s that really thrilled him to see that people still, you know, had copies of his old 78s. And it, it really must have been a wonderful time for him uh, in the sunset of his life. But now here is a man named Bob Cooper. His family acquired and ran the Jim Hotel in the 1930s, and Bob uh, hired a young Tim T-Bone Walker to lead the Jim's house band. And here's the Bluebird building as a taxi stand prior to its long life as a Fort Worth blues mecca. I think this is one of the many books, many uh, photographs that are in the book that we acquired from the local record store here named Record Town which was started by the Bruton family in 1957. And now here's a later photograph of the Bluebird. In his book, In Search of the Blues, journalist Bill Minutaglio described the Bluebird as, quote, the least stylish, maybe the best blues club anywhere. Time is frozen inside the Bluebird's fragile walls, he wrote. The tilting bend in the building makes the booths look like a line of old time roller coaster cars fading into a curve. And I, just, I just love that description. I was really happy when I came across that because that really gives you the sense of the liveliness of, of the club and uh, how even though it may have looked like it was going to fall down at any moment, it still pulsed with life every time it had a band and a crowd in there. Now here we have Robert Ely and his five careless lovers keeping the blues alive at the Bluebird. And you can see Sumter here on guitar. And I'm going to read a uh, brief section from the book here about Robert Ely. The, mu the musician who remains the most identified with the venue is Robert Ely. Born in Texarkana in 1925, 
Ely sang in church before moving to Dallas in the 20s, in his 20s. As Saturday night caught up with Sunday morning in his musical influences, he began singing the blues and drumming for other blues artists. After relocating to Fort Worth, he formed the band Boogie Chillin' with guitarist U.P. Wilson. Now in 1976, when the Bluebirds operator, Hiawatha Shotgun Gray, gave up the reins, Ely took it over and rejuvenated it as the new Bluebird nightclub. Robert Ely and his five careless lovers, a mixed race group playing for mixed race audiences, became the putative house band. He could sing any song in any key at any time, careless lover guitarist Sumter Bruton said after Ely's death in 2001. He made them up as he went along. He knew how the songs went, but you learn not to follow the words because it was impossible. Amongst his bag of vocal pyrotechnics, Ely played air harmonica. He put his hands up to his mouth and it'd sound like he was playing a harmonica, said another careless lover's guitarist, Freddy Cisneros. Then he'd take off on a scat and it wasn't like any scat heard before. Now here is Luanne Barton. I'm from Fort Worth, said the important blues singer Luann Barton. So I sing like I talk. I sing blues with a country accent. I can't help it. The late journalist Margaret Moser described Luann as, quote, a sassy Fort Worth shouter who cut her teeth playing Jacksboro Highway juke joints. We have a fair amount about uh, the famous Jacksboro Highway in the book, but that still remains a subject that I think uh, bears uh, further investigation. It's, and I, I, I remember reading somewhere that Lou Ann Barton's family operated Barber's Books here in downtown Fort Worth, but, I, but I, I'm not sure if I dreamed that or, or, or if it's really true. But he, here's another uh, female artist in, uh, in Fort Worth music history who's been important. Uh, Fort Worth blues, blues and rock drummer Linda Waring wrote star telegram critic Bob Sims in 1969 plays, quote, hunched over her drums, making savage sounds and mumbling mysteries to herself like an alchemist turning lead to gold. Okay, now we'll move on into Western Swing. Well, listen, everybody from near and far, if you want to know who we are, we're the Light Crust Doughboys from Burris Mill. Now, this uh, musical genre of Western Swing, which has been described as big band sounds on, played on string instruments, percolated to life in the Depression era, house parties, dance halls, radio stations, and flour mills here in Fort Worth. Uh, in this band here is what I'd like to think of as the, it's an early picture of the first Western Swing supergroup, the Light Crust Doughboys, with Bob Wills and vocalist M Milton Brown. And the, the announcer for the band was uh, a man named W. Lee O'Daniel. And O'Daniel, in the early part of the band's tenure just could not stand the style of music they played. He regarded it as hillbilly music and looked down on it and fired them after a few weeks when they first started the radio program. But they, the, state, the uh, radio station and the flower company received so much mail from people complaining about the absence of the Light Crust Doughboys on Fort Worth Radio that O'Daniel hired them back and put them back on the air. And, and that's when he became their announcer and started kind of trying to steal the show a little bit with all his little poems that he would write and recite on the show. Uh, it, but he was a difficult boss to get along with. And so Milton Brown soon left the Light Crust Doughboys and founded his own band, Milton Brown 
and his musical brownies. Now, one critic compared Brown's, voc Brown's charisma to Elvis Presley and cited the band as an important predecessor of rock and roll. As, as you probably know, sadly, Milton died at age 32 in 1936 after a wreck on the Jacksboro Highway. Uh, one thing that's not in the book that uh, a famous musician from Fort Worth told William, you need to put this in your book. Uh, one, one day when William met this guy, I won't say his name, but uh, he said, this is an unknown true story. Uh, not long before he died, Milton Brown met up with uh, Robert Johnson, you know, the famous blues guitarist who recorded in uh, Dallas in the 1930s and also in San Antonio. His total recorded output was uh, in those two cities. But to, according to this fellow, Milton Brown and Robert Johnson got together and cooked up a scheme to invent rock and roll in the mid-1930s. And because this person was so esteemed, we, we actually went and checked on this story with a few music historians who were more knowledgeable than we are. And everybody went, oh no, that <laughs> couldn't have happened. Uh, but anyway, uh, here's Papa Sam Cunningham's Ramblers. Sam Cunningham ran the popular dance hall Crystal, Crystal Springs Ballroom here in Fort Worth. Uh, and what, an example of how research for a project like this continues, uh, the great-grandson of Papa Sam Cunningham recently posted some photos of Crystal Springs that I'd never seen before. Uh, he posted them on a Facebook site for Western Swing Music. And I told William that I'd seen these, and uh, he actually contacted the guy. He's a, a county sheriff down in Victoria County, and he's going to be posting. He's got boxes and boxes of photos from his family of, of, the, of the bands that played at Crystal Springs. He's, he's going to be posting a lot more of those. But here you have uh, the flower salesman, W. Leo Daniel, Please Pass the Biscuits, Pappy with uh, one of the tunes that he wrote, Beautiful Texas. And this uh, image is from a little booklet I have that was a commemorative souvenir for his inauguration in 1939 as the governor of Texas. Uh, he became so popular on the radio, uh, after, the, after he was with the Light Crust Doughboys in the mid-30s, he formed his own company that was called Hillbilly Flower and formed his own Western swing band, which was called the Hillbilly Boys. And then he, he started uh, putting tunes to music, to, to words. He would write words for tunes that already existed. And, and this is one of them. Beautiful, beautiful Texas, where the land of the, where the beautiful blue bonnets grow. But uh, I understand that back in the 40s, uh, Texas school children were required to learn this song, and that, and that was demonstrated to me uh, very effectively one time. Uh, around 2005, I was giving a talk on, on border radio, uh, these, the, radio the high-powered radio sta American stations that were just across the border on Mexican soil. I was giving a talk about them for the Texas State Historical Association, and a lot of the people in the audience were at that time were older, uh, like a generation older than me. And at the end of the program, I played a recording of the Hillbilly Boys doing the song Beautiful Texas. And about half the audience started singing along with it, which uh, people told me that had never happened before at a Texas State Historical Association meeting. People just, they just didn't do that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, Pappy became such a popular media figure that he parlayed his popularity into the governor's mansion in Texas. And then in 1941, when we had a special Senate election here in Texas, uh, he threw his hat into the ring and won a Senate seat. Uh, a lot of the historians say that the powers that be in Texas at that time, through their support behind Pappy, just to get him out of Texas where they thought he could do less damage. 
because he, he turned out not to, not to be a very good statesman. Uh, you know, it's a, the old thing of, you know, you don't want a politician flying the plane or something like that. You, you want somebody who knows something about government. Uh, and, and so as one fan said, I've been listening to W.D.O. Daniel on the radio for many years, and he's a good man. It ain't his fault he didn't do nothing. Now, even as governor and senator, though, Pappy still found time to sell his own hillbilly flower. Uh, at one point, the Texas radio stations started insisting that Pappy give them copies of his speeches before he gave them on the radio because they, I guess they were nervous about what he would say. And so that made him mad, obviously. So he, he became part owner of a powerful radio station on Mexican soil just across the border. It was in Reynosa. It was, it was, the call letters were XEAW. And so for a time there, Pappy was actually addressing his constituents from a broadcasting outlet on foreign soil. And uh, this is his flower sack. I, I have a couple of these flower sacks. They're, they're not valuable or anything, but they're really hard to find. I was really happy when I, when I found a few of them. But he, ha he has some of his poetry on the flower sack, too. It goes, uh, hillbilly music on the air, hillbilly flower everywhere. It tickles your feet. It tickles your tongue. Wherever you go, its praises are sung. They've come to town with their guitars, and now they're smoking big cigars. Them hillbillies are politicians now. And Bob Wills, of course, uh, he left the Light Crust Doughboys not long after Milton Brown did, and he formed his own band, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, which of course became mega famous. Uh, and here's the king of Western Swing, as he became known, at Panther Hall here in Fort Worth. Uh, he's the one there in the, in the white hat. And I love this photo. This is uh, the nationally renowned big band leader, Paul Whiteman. He's the fellow without the hat in this photo. Uh, but he's posing here with Blackie Simmons and his Blue Jackets. They were a local... Uh, Western Swing Band, and uh, this was when Paul Whiteman spent an extended period here in Fort Worth in 1936 when his band was performing at the Frontier Centennial that, that Eamon Carter put on, put on here in, in, uh, as a, as a uh, counter to the big event over in Dallas at Fair Park. And uh, Paul Whiteman, when he was in Fort Worth, he stayed on the Van Zant Farm and he went riding every day in, in what the newspapers described as a 12-gallon hat. Now here's popular Fort Worth accordion player Jenny Mack and her brother Glenn performing at uh, Oxahatchee. Uh, now Jenny recently taught a course on Western Swing at TCU, uh, so she is... Uh, very involved with with the traditions of Western Swing. And I want, and I want to read the uh, caption for this photograph that's in the book. Fort Worth accordionist Jenny Mack has taught classes on Western Swing at TCU. She discovered the instrument when she saw an accordion player at Eagle Mountain Elementary at age seven. Then as a young teen, she discovered a new world of musical expression at Cowtown Opry's Texas Heritage Music Program in the Fort Worth Stockyards. My teacher, Devin Dawson, introduced me to 1930s and 40s Western swing bands that used a lot of accordion, she explains. Uh, shown here with her brother, Glenn McLaughlin. Uh, Glenn is a multi-genre artist and multi-instrumentalist, and his studies have included classical guitar, gypsy jazz, and swing. He's taught at the Bobby Boatwright Western Swing Camp and other schools and has shared stages with the Texas Playboys, Asleep at the Wheel, Hot Club of Cowtown, and many others. 
Now we're going to move into the gospel field. Uh, one, of, one of Fort Worth's most important gospel vocalists is this lady. Her name was Francine Morrison. And the, the journalist Bob Ray Sanders described her uh, vocal style as a soulful, deep-rooted gospel voice that could touch the heart and sting the soul. And here we have the famous gospel group known as the Chuckwagon Gang. This was a different iter iteration of the Chuckwagon Game name uh, than the earlier Western uh, tinged group that we saw. Uh, and they performed regularly on WBAP from 1936 to 1950. The leader of the group, Dave Carter, better known as Dad Carter, grew up singing in the shape note tradition. Uh, a latter-day version of the Chuckwagon Gang still performs regularly under the name today. And there was another uh, family group here in, based here in Fort Worth that I believe is still going today that was called the original, the, the original Singing Wills family. And I wanted to read a short passage about that group. Another Fort Worth gospel group still active into this century, the Singing Wills family, also shares a surname with a landmark secular ensemble. A.B. Pop Wills grew up picking cotton in Hall County alongside his first cousin, Texas Playboys band leader Bob Wills. Pop started the Wills Family Quartet in Hall County in 1938 with his three oldest children. Most, if not all seven of the Wills children, including youngest son Bob Wills, uh, participated in the group. In 1982, one of his kids, Calvin Wills, recalled with a sense of humor that the art of making a joyful noise unto the Lord also required hard work and discipline. We learned our do re mis before the ABCs, he said. That was a must. And Dad always said that if the little ones didn't try to sing, he would take them out and drown them. But we weren't worried. There wasn't much water in that dust bowl around Amarillo. They, for a long time, they had a uh, mobile Texas Gospel Museum that they would drive around and people could go on, on the bus and see uh, historic imagery. And... But we have one chapter in the book that uh, is entitled, Hath Charms to Soothe. And it uh, focuses on music performances and enjoyment in settings, unusual settings and unusual performers as well, uh, outside of the traditional concert hall or nightclub or radio station or concert hall or something like that. So this is one of the photos from that chapter of the Spring, pa Spring Palace here in Fort Worth. Uh, now th this was a wonderful fair sort of thing. <clears throat> it was a beautiful building they constructed uh, on the south side of downtown here, but it, it only lasted a year before it burned. Uh, is this was in the mid 1880s, but they had an awful lot of music at, at the at the uh, Spring Palace, and visitors enjoyed performances by such groups as the Elgin Watch, Watch Factory Band and the Mexican National Band. And in this image, you can see an unidentified orchestra playing in the interior of the Spring Palace. And this is the cover of the sheet music for a composition that was created especially for the Spring Palace. And music, just like it is today, was all over Fort Worth. You could, you could catch a musical performance most anywhere, anytime. And this fellow here, uh, his name was Robert Rolader, Rolader. Uh, he was known as the Bing Crosby of Western Union. So you can see him here delivering a singing telegram. 
Now here, this is a group of lawyers that appear to be a little bit tipsy. And they were at a uh, bar convention that was held at Eagle Mountain Lake. And they, in this image, they appear to be honing in on the vocals of the guitar, you know, of, the, of these two ladies. And the guitar player seems to be amused by it, but the accordion player seems a little nonplussed by the whole deal. Um, I guess nobody in that picture is probably alive today. Um, but th this is another great photo we got from the University of Texas Arlington uh, Special Collections. Okay, now we're going to move into jazz. And Fort Worth native Ornette Coleman, seen here performing at the opening of Caravan of Dreams in downtown Fort Worth in 1983, won the Pulitzer Prize for music in 2007. Uh, little Ornette first saw a saxophone when the Fort Worth band Sonny Strain and his Sultans of Swing came to play for Ornette and his classmates at George Washington Carver Elementary here in Fort Worth. And Ornette shined shoes and saved up for two years to buy his first saxophone. And here's Ornette with Ed Bass at the Texas Governor's Mansion in Austin on the occasion of Ornette receiving the Texas Arts Medal in 2007. And here's Fort Worth's beloved jazz historian and mentor, Marjorie Crenshaw, who passed away in 2019. She's on the left in, in this photo with the great Duke Ellington here in Fort Worth. Marjorie began playing organ and piano in church and discovered jazz on a trip to New Orleans with her mother. I never thought of myself as a jazz musician because I wanted to see the notes, she said in 2018. But then someone in church one day came up to her and told her that what she was playing is jazz. As Marjorie said, I just learned how to feel it. Now this uh, is another photograph from UT Arlington. Uh, this is from a damaged negative or, or glass plate. And this is believed to be uh, a Fort Worth man by the name of Uday Bowman. And he's remembered for the hugely popular hit that he wrote, uh, the hugely popular ragtime hit that he wrote entitled 12th Street Rag which he wrote while playing in a shoeshine parlor between 10th and 11th streets in Fort Worth. Uh, some historians say that he wrote it in Kansas City, but um, more, more accounts that I've seen uh, contend that he, that he wrote it here in Fort Worth. But I, I want to read a brief passage about that from the book. With its usual combination of a repeating three-note melody, with its unusual, rather, combination of a repeating three-note melody and duple-metered bass, wrote one historian, the song had a profound influence on jazz from the late 1920s through the 1940s. The piece was recorded by such seminal figures as Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Fats Waller, Count Basie, Benny Goodman, Bob Wills, and Liberace. Uh, Texas jazz historian Dave Oliphant observed that it was waxed by more artists than all of ragtime master Scott Joplin's compositions combined. So it, it was a very, very popular song. Now we hear, here we have a popular big band jazz man, Tex Bideke. He grew up in Fort Worth where he graduated from Pascal High School and played in local bands. He became famous for hits like Chattanooga Choo Choo and Kalamazoo that he recorded with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. A critic wrote of Tex in a 1940 issue of the magazine Metronome, and this is, this is a quote that I think any musician anywhere would love to have said about them, about the instrument they play. He plays the sort of tenor you smile at the minute you hear it. 
is full of color and depth, light and shade, soul and body. Now here is Fort Worth multi-instrumentalist Jimmy Revito on accordion as his band played for President John F. Kennedy at the Texas Hotel on the morning of November 22nd. Uh, it was likely the last live music that the president ever heard. I'll remember that dark day forever, the band leader said. And anybody who was alive in this area at that, at that time remembers it forever as well. Now here's big band and jazz drummer Sumter Bruton. This, now this is the father of the guitarist Sumter Bruton that we've already seen in different bands. And, and also uh, his brother, the guitarist Stephen Bruton. And uh, big band and jazz drummer Sumter Bruton opened Fort Worth's Venerable Record Town store in 1957 after graduating from TCU with a degree in business. His bandmates and collaborators through the years read like a who's who of Fort Worth musicians. And we, ha we have a number of those listed in the book. But now we move on to good old country western. Now, Ernest Tubb hitchhiked into Cowtown from San Angelo in 1940. And though he only stayed here for two years, they were two very important years for his career as well as for the modern country western idiom. Getting a radio show on KGKO, he began the shift from being a Jimmy Rogers imitator to one of the founders of the Texas and American honky-tonk sound. Now for a time uh, when he was here, Ernest performed as the gold chain troubadour. Uh, flower companies, that was another local flower company and they sponsored music of all kinds uh, in Fort Worth and all around North Texas. And, and Ernest worked for the gold chain flower company. As the gold chain troubadour, Tub, par, Dub, Tub played parking lot shows all over North Texas advertising gold chain flower. And he wrote one of his greatest songs, Walking the Floor Over You, in a lonely Fort Worth apartment when his wife Elaine uh, took the kids after an argument and went to visit family in San Antonio. And you can just picture skinny Ernest pacing around in, the, in a little apartment somewhere, somewhere here in Fort Worth, coming up with this song, you know, and the, and the phrase, I'm walking the floor over you, popping up in his head. And, and then when a local jukebox operator told Ernest that his songs, uh, his records needed to be louder because uh, in, in honky-tonks and clubs, when the crowd started getting loud, they would quit playing Ernest Tubb records and start playing louder records by people like Bob Wills who had bigger bands and, and put out a louder sound. So his recording of uh, Walking the Floor Over You, which uh, don't tell Ay Eamon Carter, but it was actually recorded in Dallas, uh, although he wrote it here in Fort Worth. Uh, but that was the first time on record that Ernest Tubb had an electric guitar, added an electric guitar to his sound. And here's Ernest in later years. He often came back to Fort Worth. He loved Fort Worth. And uh, whenever he came to town, the first thing he would do would be go to the Mexican Inn, have a, uh, a Tex-Mex dinner. But he, here he is at, at Panther Hall with the great DJ and songwriter Bill Mack standing off to the side. It, it was one, one of the... Most, one of the saddest things while we were working on this book was that Bill passed away because I, I really wanted him to see the book because I, I think he would have liked it. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm glad we have him represented with this photo here. Okay, now here uh, is the Club Paradise on the Mansfield Highway. I understand the Mansfield Highway was almost as wild as the Jacksboro Highway back in the day. 
But uh, one thing about the books, I really like seeing all the female musicians that are that are in the book. Uh, and, and here we have Vita Mae Spoon on steel guitar with Johnny Strawn on fiddle, Ray Chaney at the mic, and uh, a man named Frankie Kenman seated on guitar. Uh, and we're, we're indebted to our friend Kevin Coffey, who was a Fort Worth native <clears throat> who started collecting material and images about of Fort Worth artists and country western artists and western swing musicians from the time that he was a, a young teenager pretty much. And so he has an amazing collection and his knowledge of, of of the art form is, is just uncanny. Uh, so we're really indebted to Kevin for his help with the book. Now let's move into the Tejano section of the book. Um, this is a Fort Worth band that was uh, named Claudio Mata's Mexican, Mexican Charo Orchestra. And uh, they became a legend on the south side of Fort Worth with boleros, rancheras, and other Mexican uh, musical forms. And he, and he brought these song, this musical uh, material with him from his, from his roots in the Mexican state of San Luis Potosi. And I want to read just a tiny bit about Mr. Mata. Over in Cowtown, Claudio Mata also gave musical lessons teaching not only music theory, but brushing up his neighbor's Spanish as well. Born in 1898 in San Luis Potosi, Mata himself was proficient on clarinet, piano, violin, guitar, drums, and mandolin. After moving to Fort Worth in 1916, he found work helping to build the bridge across Lake Worth. Settling into a day job at Texas Steel, he worked at the mill for some 42 years. An era radio show on KFJZ extended the orchestra's audience. One of his last compositions, the New Freedom March, dedicated to President Kennedy, was copyrighted shortly before Mata's own death in 1964. Now the musical Sands family became a legend on the north side of Fort Worth after patriarch Leoniso Nicho Sands arrived in 1941 from his home in the Rio Grande Valley where he learned to play accordion as a child after a ranch hand joined the army and left his squeeze box on the ranch where, Mata, where Sands grew up. Oh, this, this is uh, Claudio Mata's daughter here. And here's the, the science operation. This is a Nicho in the middle with his two, two of his sons on, on each side there. Now we're going into rhythm and blues. Fort Worth rhythm, rhythm and blues singer Ray Sharp was multicultural before multiculturalism was cool. Growing up in public housing projects, he was nicknamed the Hillbilly for his early love of country western music. And even as late as 1981, one of his gigs at the Sundancer Club here in Fort Worth was described as the boogie blues and funky country music. Back in 1959, a Ray Sharp show at a black Fort Worth nightclub called Watkins Paradise actually led to the arrest of black and white patrons who were for race mixing on the dance floor. These people were charged with race mixing just for dancing. However, the, the authorities soon realized that that was ridiculous and dropped the charges. So you, you might remember Ray's biggest hit, Linda Lou. Okay, R&B rocker Delbert McClinton here at the microphone uh, gave his first public performance in 1957 at the Big V Jamboree in the White Settlement area when he sang Ray Price's hit, Crazy Arms. Fort Worth record man Major Bill Smith hired Delbert and his band as studio musicians for the Cotton Pickin' Smashes 
that Major Bill Smith produced. And one of those records, Hey Baby by Bruce Chanel, was such a cotton pick and smash that it took the crew to London where legend says that Delbert taught Beatle John, John Lennon how to play the harmonica. I think Delbert himself has discounted that story, so I'm not absolutely sure how, if it's really true. But let's move on into the 60s here. Uh, William, my collaborator on this book, uh, <clears throat> in the early 2000s, uh, we started having some reunions of people that had known each other for a long time in, in the Dallas area. And uh, William formed this, uh, a, uh, an internet group on, on Yahoo, a, kind of a chat group and thing where people would share f images and memories uh, of their bands back in the 60s and early 70s. And it was called Big D 60s. And then as time went on, uh, and William started realizing that Fort Worth was just as interesting in Dallas, so he expanded his documenting of these bands to include Fort Worth and changed the name of the uh, effort to Trinity River Music, which he, he's still continuing that today, uh, still scanning imagery from, uh, uh, he just got a lot of images from the Sumter Bruton collection that he's scanning that uh, have pictures of the entire Bruton family. Uh, so, he, so he's working very hard on that. This band is, uh, is called Larry and the Blue Notes, and they were one of Fort Worth's leading garage bands of the 1960s. And one garage band scholar, uh, this fellow lived, lives in Philadelphia or Canada or someplace, but, but he's an impartial authority on, on, the, on the subject. But the scholar gave Cowtown's bands, quote, a very high batting average with records that will always sound good. The Blue Notes recorded three versions of their opus about the famous Lake Worth Goat Monster. And this image is from a three CD, 72 song reissue set of 60s Fort Worth Garage Band recordings with a unique regional sound produced by Fort Worth music musicologist Larry Harrison and David Campbell. The bands on the set included the Nats, the Nomads, the Cynics, the Barons, and the Elite. I always liked the, the names of bands from back in those days. There, for some reason, there was also a craze. Uh, one of our subheads in the si chapter about the 60s is 60s bands in need of spell check because they were always spelling the name of their band in a, in a different way than it was normally spelled. But uh, David Campbell, who worked on this set, attributes some of the local scene's manic energy to the power of pop, specifically the original Dublin bottled Dr. Pepper, which was billed as a pep pill of soda pop. It was loaded with caffeine and imperial pure cane sugar, so I'm, I'm sure it did give these young musicians a boost. And here's Haltom High School's band, The Barons, performing in the fabric department of a downtown uh, department store, and we think this may have been Leonard's. And you can see uh, patterns on the, back, on the wall in the background there. Where the, where the boys set up in, in the store and, and played. And of course, Leonard's is, is famous in local music history as the store where the guy was sitting outside selling pencils that Willie, Willie Nelson immortalized in the song, Pretty Paper. Now this is Cowtown's all-girl 60s band, the Candy Canes. And of course, they, they didn't, spell it C-A-N-D-Y, they were candy canes with K's. But they became so popular that they had to get their schooling on the road as they toured all the way to Canada. Fort Worth recently renamed a street for Pascal High grad and Oscar-winning producer T-Bone Burnett. As a Cowtown teen musician himself, Burnett told another producer if I don't sound like the Beatles on my recordings, 
I'm going to die. But fortunately, he lived. Now, this might be Fort Worth's first family of the Trinity River Groove. Drummers, some Sumter Bruton and his two guitar star sons, Sumter Jr. and Stephen Bruton. Uh, Sumter Jr. Gravi gravitated to the blues, and Stephen played with a wide variety of artists, including Christop Chris Christopherson, Bob Dylan, and many others. And Stephen often spoke of playing Zen guitar and advised younger musicians that each instrument they owned would become, quote, kind of like a dog, a real section of your life. And I, I think those are words that ring true to anybody that's ever played an instrument. So did any of y'all ever go to the Notorious Cellar Club here in Fort Worth? I, I, I went to the one in Dallas a few times, and uh, it was kind of a wild place. I was a little bit intimidated <laughs> to be there a lot of times. Uh, the, the clubs had kind of a, a uh, <clears throat> gritty reputation, but they were, they were basically pretty harmless. But, uh, but it's, it's said that uh, the Secret Service frequented the Fort Worth Cellar Club here on November, the night of November 21st, 1963. And if you did go, you might remember their slogan emblazoned on the wall. You must be weird or you wouldn't be here. And though there were cellar clubs in uh, Dallas and Houston, we can say with scholarly certitude that the subterranean hipster hangout was pure 50s and 60s and pure Fort Worth. Now we're going to just conclude with running through uh, a bunch of images of uh, Fort Worth musicians and uh, scenes from Fort Worth music history, and, uh, and I'll just identify each of them briefly. Action a go go. Arvell Strickland and the Jokers. Bobby Crown and the Capers. And Capers, of course, is spelled with a K. Need spell check. The great Bobby Peters. Bobby Peters was a fascinating guy. He had, he had his own uh, big band. Uh, and we, we have a book, uh, and then he also had his uh, TV show here in Fort Worth where he was always dressing up in costumes. Uh, if you go on that website, the Portal to Texas History, you can find a whole bunch of photos of Bobby Peters dressed up in different costumes. And uh, I chose this one. Uh, for the book because I, I just thought that was so great of him sitting on a, a small horse hold, dressed up in a cowboy outfit holding his guitar. And we have a picture in the book of uh, an odd grouping. I, I don't know how this ever came together, but uh, it's a picture of Jack Ruby and little Jimmy Dickens, the grand old loppy star, and then uh, uh, a, a Irving based musician whose name I'm having a senior moment on right now, but then, then next to them is Bobby Peters. And I, I, I can't imagine whatever got that group together. Okay, this is Boogie Uproar at Daddy O's. Bruce Chanel. And here again is the Bruton family with Mrs. Bruton in their record store, Record Town. Buddy Whittington as a teenager. Fred Papa Calhoun. Robert Ely and his five careless lovers at Panther Hall. And there you can see Sumter Bruton on guitar again. Now this is Bill Case and his Melody Boys. Uh, one of the musicians in this band was uh, the father of uh, Fort Worth jazz pianist Johnny Case. And we have, we have pictures of Johnny in the book, and Johnny let us use a lot of his photos from his collection. Now, this is the Casino Beach Ballroom. Charlie Mitchell and the Southern Stars. Jim Jones and the Shantes with DJ Marky Baby. Cornell Dupree. The Crystal Springs Dance Pavilion. The Cynics 
60s band, Dean Turner. Dean Turner was kind of an obscure figure, but uh, we have several pictures of him and his band and his son who was in the band in the book. Uh, and I, I, he was another one that I really enjoyed learning about and uh, who's kind of lost to history. Uh, so we have one page that's, that's devoted to nothing but photos of Dean Turner and his band with a lengthy caption about all of his activities. And here's Denny Baker, Denny Beckner, the madcap merrymaker. Denny Dewey Redman, Dimebag Darrell. This, this steps a little bit out of, outside of Fort Worth. Dimebag Barrel was from Arlington. Eddie Cleanhead Vinson, the Flying X Ranch Boys. Now this man with guitar, we don't know who he is, but I, I got this image from the Tarrant County Archives. Uh, and I, I just thought it was a fascinating picture because I, I can't figure out what the thing is he has at the top of his guitar there. Uh, and he's wearing some, a bunch of medals. I don't know if that's a military thing or, or he, if he won some guitar competition or something, but uh, this is one of the, we, we had to cull down the images that are in the book from well over a thousand, uh, maybe even 1,500, 1,800, down to about 500 to, so they could all fit in the book. And this is one of the ones that we really hated to lose because I, I just think it's so uh, flavorful. Now this is a, oh heck, I'm having another senior moment here on this guy's name. Uh, uh, let, me, let me look it up real quick. He deserves to be, I would open the book to just his picture. Gene Ball. Now, he was a native of Son Sonora, and he served as music director of WBAP from 1931 to 1949. And before he located to Fort Worth, he led a band at the Baker Hotel in Mineral Wells. A cellist, he was also on the fac faculty of Texas Wesleyan University. Here, Baugh's orchestra graces the ballroom stage at what appears to be Fort Worth's Blackstone Hotel. And the uh, guitar player in this band is the same guitarist who played electric guitar on uh, Ernest Hubb's recording of uh, Walking the Floor Over You. Okay, now this is the, is, uh, the High Flyers, another Western swing band. And here's guitar man James Hinkle. Here's the great Homer Henderson. Uh, we... We lost Homer, I think, last year. Uh, he, he was a real colorful musician. He, uh, one of his tunes was uh, about Lee Harvey Oswald, and the, one of the, some of the lines were like, uh, he used to throw a ball to me when I was a kid. They say he shot the president, but I don't think he did. And here we have the Humphreys brothers, uh, now, I'm not, we're not sure if these boys lived in Fort Worth or spent a lot of time here, but we wanted to include this photo in the book because it was done, it, this picture was taken in a Fort Worth uh, photography studio, and I, I just thought it was such an impactful photo and, and provided a real nice window into a band of brothers back at that time that were all learning different string instruments. And here is the great J.B. Brinkley. J.B. Brinkley was a master guitarist, and uh, we have a long caption uh, in the book for this photo. I was able to get on the Star Telegram archives and just go through the years, and I found many, many, many entries on what J.B. Brinkley was doing musically. And he, he played across genres from Western swing to country western to jazz. And here uh, is Jerry Case, Johnny Case's brother, Jesse Powell, Jimmy Caps and the Country Boys, 
John Denver. John Denver went to high school in Fort Worth. The uh, piano player Johnny Case. Johnny Reno and the Sax Maniacs with Doyle Bramhall. The Juke Jumpers at the Bluebird. Julius Hemphill. King Curtis at the Rustler's Rest. Gospel artist Kirk Franklin. Leon Roush and his Texas Playboys. Montgomery Ward Store Trailblazers. The Majestic Theater on 7th Street. The Motherlode on Azle Avenue. The Motivators at the Holiday Hop. Johnny Nitziger. The Nomads. Panther Hall on East Lancaster. The Paradise Club. Patty Lou and the Texas Sweethearts, Ray Chaney and his ranch hands at the stagecoach, Robin Styler, uh, Bill Ham and the Rocks, Ronald Shannon Jackson, the Skyliner on Jacksboro Highway, Slim Ritchie, Oliver Sock Underwood, Space Opera, the Plaids with Ray Torres, Towns Vans. Oh, no, that one was Stella Club. Now, this is the Plaids with Ray Torres. Towns Van Zant, the Tracer Club, the Texas Cowgirls, the Universal Cowboys, the Utah Cowboy. This cowboy singer grew up in Fort Worth and won a radio contest here. And then when he became a professional radio and entertainer, for some reason, he took the name the Utah Cowboy, even though he'd never been to Utah. Van Cliburn and James Revito, WBAP's Saturday Morning Roundup. And Willie Nelson lived here uh, in the 50s and, and was a local DJ and played around in nightclubs. And this is one of his bands that played on the Jacksboro Highway. And I think this is the greatest band name ever, Willie Nelson and the Dumplin' Eaters. The Dazzling Zanzibar on East Rosedale. I want to thank you very much for being here and thank you to the library and the TCU Center for Texas Studies for having us. Thank you, Gene. Um, I see we've got some comments on our from our Zoomers. Uh, let me navigate to that. Uh, all right, where was the Bluebird located? That was over on um, Horn in, in, in Como. It's... Um, south of 30. And the building's still there. And uh, somebody wanted to know how old were the candy canes? Well, they were in high school, so they would have been, you know, 16, 17, something like that. Okay. Um, and then, oh, and we've got an answer from Reba Henry. The Bluebird was in Como on Horn Street, close to Camp Bowie. Um, and then somebody says that they had no idea John Denver was from the area. Mark Watson said, awesome presentation, thank you. Same from Laura Gonzalez. She said she enjoyed the presentation and thank you for sharing. Do we have any additional questions, either from Zoom or in person? Go ahead. I'd like to ask, have you ever been in the Bluebird? Okay, so she's asking if you've ever been in the Bluebird? I have not. It's just all boarded up, and I hope someday that they uh, make it a historical Place That'd be a great museum. <laughs> Next question. First, I want to say I was actually at your talk at the TSHA on water radio oh, wow. <laughs> in 2005. You. Uh, you mentioned John Lomax. Was that the same John Lomax that recorded Robert Johnson in both San Antonio and Dallas? So if you'll repeat the question, please. Uh, I, I didn't know that Lomax was involved in that. Somebody that did it through a public service works program and it was in 37 and 38 well right? he, yeah he recorded he recorded at a hotel in san antonio and then in dallas he recorded at that building on park 508 park and it was at the gunther in san antonio right which is now owned by one of the big chains but they have a room dedicated right yeah and they, in, in their bar they had they have drinks named for his songs that was the library of congress folk music preservation project from the it was part of the um, works progress administration 
And John Lomax the uh, third came through Texas. Re he lives in Nashville now, but uh, he came through Texas recently, giving a program about his family's history in, in collecting American music and preserving American music uh, in, through the field recordings that they did. So, and he gave some uh, performances of, of acapellas, acapella performances of some of the songs that his grandfather and his uh, uncle collected and uh, he did it in maybe Houston and Austin and then in Meridian because John Lomax was originally from Meridian mm -hmm. and he would lay in bed and listen to cowboys singing to the cattle as they went up the Chisholm, Chisholm Trail okay. not too far from their house. That's awesome. And we have, we have I mean, this, it's a pretty well known story. We have a little passage in the book though in the singing cowboy chapter and, I, and I would have just loved to find a photo of this, but I think it was in 1909 or something like that, uh, around then, that uh, John Avery Lomax came here, and he had this big recording contraption to collect these songs on, and he went into the White Elephant Saloon, which at the time was on Main Street, and uh, tried to record cowboys singing some of their songs, and they were, they were all a little bit freaked out by the recording contraption. <laughs> So he had to just write, write things down that he could get him by the singing to the machine at, the, at that time. Okay, um, any other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody in person and also on Zoom for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.